Hi, I'm Fredo Rockwell, and welcome to another episode of Strange Politics. Let's start with a quiz. America's first National Party convention to choose a presidential candidate was held in September 1831. Can you guess the party which held it? If you guessed the Democrats, that's a good guess, but no. The first Democratic National Convention was not held for another eight months in May 1832. If you guessed the Republicans, hmm, not such a good guess. The Republican Party was not actually founded until 1854, 23 years later. If you guessed the Whigs, nope. The Whig Party would not be founded until 1833, two years after the first National Presidential Nominating Convention. Believe it or not, the correct answer is the Anti-Masonic Party. And yes, this was a real political party which, even though it ended up as an abysmal failure, was briefly a potent force in American politics. Before we explain who the Anti-Masons were, we need to first explain who the Masons are. Masons, also known as Freemasons, are members of a worldwide network of loosely interconnected fraternal organizations. Freemasonry is often described as a secret society, as its members practice secret rituals, have secret passwords, and greet each other with secret handshakes. But the existence of Freemasonry itself has not been a secret for over 300 years. Four Masonic lodges based in London revealed their existence to the world in 1717 and created the first Grand Lodge. Freemasonry must have started some time before this, but exactly when, where, and the reasons why are much debated. Many of the most famous people in history have been Freemasons, including Mozart, Frederick the Great of Prussia, and the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And many of America's founding fathers were also Masons, including Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and Robert Livingston. Livingston is not a household name today, but he was one of the three men who helped Thomas Jefferson draft the Declaration of Independence. He also served as the third Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of New York. New York is very important in this story, so that's why he's mentioned here. Of course, most of America's founding fathers were not Freemasons. Maybe only about a quarter were. But a number of myths and wild conspiracy theories have grown up around the role Freemasons have played in American history. And whether or not you think Freemasonry is a force for good, a force for evil, or just some people doing some silly things in private, their use of secrecy and ritual has made many people intensely suspicious about them over the years. That suspicion has often turned into fear and hatred. In 1826, suspicion, fear, and hatred of Freemasons went into overdrive in western New York following the disappearance of a local bricklayer named William Morgan. Morgan had moved into the area a few years previously and claimed he had been initiated as a Mason while living in Canada. Many local Masons thought Morgan was lying about this or simply didn't like him, and they refused to admit him to their lodges. Offended and possibly looking for a chance to make a bit of money, Morgan announced he would write a book which would expose the secrets of Freemasonry to the world. Morgan wrote his book, but before it could be published, he was arrested, and not long after he was arrested, he disappeared. Many people presume Morgan had been murdered by angry Freemasons, and there are some reasons to think this might actually have been the case. Even some historians today think murder is the most likely explanation, although there has never been any definitive proof one way or the other. The Morgan Affair, as it was known, sparked public outrage against Freemasons across western New York, and soon a burgeoning anti-Masonic movement began to form. One person who definitely believed Morgan had been murdered by Freemasons was newspaper publisher Thurlow Weed. Weed had worked for the Rochester Telegraph, but was forced out in 1828, he claimed, by Freemasons. He founded a new competing newspaper in Rochester, which he called the Anti-Masonic Inquirer. Thanks in part to Weed, the Morgan Affair, as it is known, became a sensation and its story spread across the United States. We did not stop with just newspaper stories, however. Like most newspaper publishers of his day, he was actively involved in politics, and he helped found a new political party, the Anti-Masonic Party. Now, before we go any further, 
It is important to explain that the most famous Freemason in the country at the time of the Morgan affair was Andrew Jackson. Jackson was elected president in 1828, two years after Morgan's disappearance. Jackson was a high-ranking Mason and had served as Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Tennessee in 1822. He was also publicly vocal in his support of Freemasonry and its ideals. And Jackson was a highly controversial president. For the 1828 election, he ignored most of the political norms of the day and seized control of the ruling Democratic-Republican Party. He then forced the sitting president out of the party and beat him. That defeated president was John Quincy Adams. At this point in American history, party politics was much less developed than it is today. Parties did not really have official names or leadership structures, but the process of developing a much more formal party system was underway. Jackson's faction of the Democratic Republicans coalesced into what is known today simply as the Democratic Party. Meanwhile, Adams and his supporters, after being kicked out of the old Democratic Republicans, formed a short-lived party initially known simply as the Anti-Jacksonians. But many of Adams' supporters, especially those in northeastern states, instead turned to the Anti-Masonic Party. The Anti-Masons did not put up a candidate for president in the 1828 election, which Andrew Jackson won, but they did win five seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, three in New York and one in Vermont and one in Pennsylvania. Two years later, in 1830, anti-Masonic candidate William A. Palmer was successfully elected governor of Vermont. While in office, Palmer attempted to make it illegal to administer a Masonic oath and tried to force the Grand Lodge of Vermont to disband. The 1830 elections also saw the anti-Masonic party increase its membership in the U.S. House of Representatives from 5 to 17. John Quincy Adams, not content to leave politics behind, took an unprecedented step for a former president and ran for Congress in 1830. He won. Adams clashed with the anti-Jacksonians in his home state of Massachusetts, however, and switched his allegiance to the anti-Masonic party instead. The anti-Masons had political momentum and a former president in their ranks. For a time, at least, it seemed like they were going places. In September 1831, as mentioned before, the anti-Masonic party held the first presidential nominating convention in American history in Baltimore, Maryland. By this time, the party had begun broadening its issues beyond just fighting Freemasonry. It supported government spending on infrastructure projects and erecting protective tariffs to limit foreign imports. The party was still interested in trying to stamp out Freemasonry, but, especially with former President Adams playing an active role, it became increasingly focused on defeating one Freemason in particular, Andrew Jackson. At the convention, Adams encouraged the party to nominate Richard Rush, his former running mate from the 1828 election. Rush might have proven to be a very strong candidate for president, but much to Adams' frustration, he declined the nomination. After failing to agree on any one candidate, the convention eventually settled on William Wirt. Wirt lived in Baltimore and was attending the convention more out of curiosity than loyalty to the party, but he had served under Adams as attorney general and seemed like a good choice, at least on paper. It became clear almost immediately after Wirt accepted his nomination that he was, in fact, a terrible candidate for the anti-Masonic party. The biggest problem was that Wirt was a Freemason, or at least had been one before. He was willing to condemn the murder of William Morgan, if that's indeed what had happened, but he was unwilling to say anything bad about Freemasonry in general. And he made this clear to the party during his acceptance speech. Wirt also regretted accepting the nomination almost as soon as he had done it. He declined to engage in any campaigning and even refused to write letters to his friends asking for their votes. The anti-Masonic party, despite being led by a non-campaigning presidential candidate who refused to condemn Masonry, still managed some respectively impressive results in the 1832 election. Wirt won a state, Vermont, which had seven electoral college votes at the time. The party also increased its seats in the House of Representatives to 25. This was, without doubt, a high-water mark for the anti-Masonic party, things pretty much started falling apart from here. One huge problem for the party was Andrew Jackson's decision not to seek a third term in the White House. Instead, Jackson's vice president, Martin Van Buren, was a Democratic candidate for president in 1836. Problematically for the party, Van Buren was not a Freemason. The anti-Masons considered nominating William Henry Harrison, the former governor of the Indiana Territory and a hero of the War of 1812, but when the party asked Harrison to assure them he wasn't a Freemason, he declined to answer. 
The possibility of nominating a second Freemason for president, especially to run against an opponent who definitely wasn't one, was a big concern. The anti-Masonic party decided not to nominate anyone for president in the end. The new Whig party did nominate Harrison for president in 1836, though, and he ended up with a respectable 36% of the popular vote. Harrison ran again in the 1840 presidential election, again as a Whig, and this time he won, defeating Van Buren in a narrow victory. By 1835, the anti-Masons' only remaining political stronghold was in Pennsylvania. The Democrats controlled the state legislature and the governor's office, but they were badly split over the issue of whether or not to continue funding public schools. The anti-Masons, with support from the new and growing Whig Party, took advantage of the split and nominated Joseph Rittner for governor. Rittner was a rabid foe of Freemasons everywhere, but he decided he might need their votes to win the election. To avoid upsetting Masons, he focused his campaign on ending the corruption of the Democratic administration. He even made a direct appeal to Freemasons for their votes, saying that voting for him would be conclusive proof that they consider their obligations to their country superior to their secret oaths. Rittner won the election, but by the time he finished his term, the anti-Masonic party had largely ceased to exist. The shrinking anti-Masonic contingent in the U.S. House of Representatives was wiped out in the 1838 elections. By the time of the 1840 election, the party had largely, if unofficially, been absorbed by President Harrison's Whig party. Two decades after its founding, one member of the anti-Masonic party did eventually reach the White House, Millard Fillmore. He began his political career as an anti-Mason when he was elected to the New York State Legislature in 1828. Fillmore was elected vice president in 1848 as a member of the Whig Party and ascended to the presidency a year later, following the death of President Zachary Taylor. Fillmore is generally considered to be one of America's most forgettable presidents. When the next presidential election came around in 1852, the Whig Party decided to nominate someone else. And that was the end of the anti-Masonic Party, which in practice was only interested in opposing one particular Freemason, Andrew Jackson and did not manage to do even this at all effectively. But although an outright failure, the story of the anti-Masonic party is at least interesting, and it provides a great example of why conspiracy theories make very poor foundations for political movements. Yes, many of America's most prominent founding fathers were Freemasons, but most weren't. And yes, many American presidents have been Freemasons, including Harry S. Truman, but most have not been. The truth is, Freemasons are either uninterested in maintaining a grip on the American political structure, or, if they are, they don't seem to be able to do it for very long at a time. Maintaining momentum for an anti-Masonic party during the times when there are no Freemasons to battle was simply not possible. Thanks for watching another episode of Strange Politics. There are more episodes to come in this series, so please be sure to subscribe. <laughs>